now take you to the broadcast of It's Time with Reverend Nathaniel W. Martin. Here is Reverend Martin. And Happy New Year to everybody. Hey, good to see everybody, all my friends out there that are listening and looking and watching. Y'all got to give me a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button on the bottom of uh, this uh, telecast page. Thumbs up and whatever else it is. Thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, my name is Pastor Nathaniel Wayne Martin. I'm the pastor of the New Life uh, Institutional Baptist Church here in uh, Los Angeles. And we are located at 8916 South Main Street and in the beautiful city of Los Angeles. I keep saying that. And uh, we have services on Sundays beginning at uh, 11 a.m. and on Wednesdays at 7 and on Friday nights, which is this very night, at 7 p.m. We have, we're sharing the building with the Shiloh Missionary Christian Church and my good friend, Pastor Dr. Della F. Holliness. And I want you to come by and worship with us this year. Come by, let us see you, let us pray with you. Uh, and encourage you on your journey here in this life. That's all right. Now, the, this offering that you're looking at and are looking upon, hopefully, is entitled It's Time. And we started it ooh, a couple of years ago. And the uh, question to be asked is, what is it time for? Well, good. It's time for justice. And that is what we are about. We are about social justice. That must include uh, environmental justice. Look what we're doing to the world, to the earth. Look at the pollution. Someone said, I wrote an article uh, yesterday that says that uh, Generation Z, which is after Generation X, I think I'm up with the baby boomers, <laughs> that Generation Z is going to inherit all the mess that we have made of the environment. And uh, they will be the ones that will be uh, suffering the most if we don't get our heads wrapped around climate change and uh, wrapped around environmental degradation uh, of this good earth that God has, has so kindly uh, allowed us to have. And we have... Uh, show him what we think about it by the way we have abused uh, this good ground. Uh, I'm not unmindful that the biggest polluter on the face of the earth is the United States of America. Yes, us. We pollute uh, the earth far more than uh, any other nation, uh, and yet we do the least uh, to sign climate, climate accords and uh, under the present uh, presidential administration, we are actually in denial that climate change or global warming is even occurring. Uh, but believe you, my believe you, me, my friends, it is real. Uh, not to get sidestepped on uh, environment, because we, along with that, uh, we we must have economic justice. Uh, after all. Uh, there was 250 years of this country of affirmative action for white people uh, in which all of the benefits, all of the advantages, all of the profit, all of the wealth accrued to the white people who were holding the black people, my people, in slavery. And uh, every day that they got wealthier was a day that uh, was another day that we became uh, poorer. And now you're counting a minimum a minimum of legalized 250 years uh, of uh, unrequited toil, as Abraham Lincoln was quite fond of saying. Uh, this is not to omit or neglect or ignore the fact that slavery in this continent actually uh, was formally instituted in 1619. No, we cannot forget that. I only spoke of the 250 years of so-called legalized uh, when the fledgling uh, United States, which had previously been the 13 colonies, uh, began to form a more uh, perfect uh, union. All right. And uh, 
that did not end until the great civil war. But let us read the reparations scripture. Oh, I forgot to mention, our economics must always involve reparations. Reparations means to restore, to repair, to make whole something or someone that has suffered injury or loss at the hands of another. Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 12 begins these words, And if thy brother, an Hebrew man, or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him or her go free from thee. And when thou sendest them out free from thee, thou shalt not let them go away empty. Thou shalt furnish them liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Thou shalt give unto them. Trying to avoid so much of the controversy uh, engendered by the uh, opening words, if thy brother a Hebrew man, and then the next phrase, or a Hebrew woman, uh, because we know that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. So even though it doesn't say, or if thy sister, it is implied by the phrase, or an Hebrew woman. Be that as it may, notice that slavery was only the last no more than seven years. It was not to be perpetual. It was not to be where one lost one's identity or one's culture or one's religion or one's selfhood. Uh, neither was it to be uh, eternal or perpetual, whereas uh, I was born a slave, I lived a slave, I had kids, they weren't kids, they were slaves, and so forth. That was never the uh, biblical uh, mandate or the biblical command or the biblical intent. Uh, the scripture declares that out of one blood God made all men for to dwell upon the face of all of the earth. And regardless of how we have uh, misrepresented the scriptures, we collectively as mankind as at, at, up on the face of this uh, uh, good ground, uh, the Bible never meant for slavery to become the stigma that it became as it was, as it degenerated into the practices of chattel slavery here in the uh, United States of America. Uh, that said, you notice it was only no more than six years, and the person was not to lose uh, their selfhood or their identity or their personality uh, or their name or, or their culture or their language, or their religion. But all of that was what the so-called uh, southern states, really what the, the 13 colonies uh, perpetrated upon the people who they enslaved, uh, who were kidnapped, who were captured, who were stolen away from their homeland, their continent of Africa, uh, from the door they went were brought through the door of no return there in Senegal and uh, brought here to the shores of, of the uh, Northern Hemisphere. And they never got a letter from home. Nobody ever came from home to see about them, to see how they were doing uh, or anything like that. And uh, that was a... a a holocaust, because so many millions uh, perished in the passage, in the Middle Atlantic Passage, Middle Passage as it's called, as it is known. And it also precipitated a huge war in this country before we finally got rid of slavery, even though it had been enshrined in the very Constitution uh, that formed the basis of a more perfect union here in these uh, United States of America. Talk about leadership. Well, how would you like to have been in the case, in the shoes and the position of the 16th president 
of the United States of America. You talk about leadership, how to lead. Donald Trump says nobody ever had it as hard as he's had it. Uh, when he came into the office of the presidency. Oh, my savior. How would you like to have been in the shoes of Abraham Lincoln? Before he could get in the inaugural address in the March of uh, 1861, seven, seven states had already seceded from the Union. And remember, now we have 50 states, but in those days we had less than, uh, I think, 33 states uh, because uh, Kansas came in just as the war was beginning, but it may not have been no more than, say, 29 states total. And look at, you lose seven states before you can give your inaugural address. How huh? you in terrible trouble. You remember that there, between uh, the election, as we have it, uh, November 8th election, and then January 20th is when we uh, inaugurate the new president. And uh, that means all kind of mischief can happen between the you winning the election and the person who is still president can work all manner of, of harm and mischief before you get to take your inaugural address. Uh, oath of office, rather, in uh, January 20th. But Abraham Lincoln had been elected in November. All the ballots had been counted, November 1860. But he did not get inaugurated until March in those days, uh, 1861. And uh, between the time of his election <laughs> to the time of his inauguration, poof, Huh? Seven states had seceded. Would you have had the courage to go ahead and accept the presidency of a nation where seven states, seven states, count them, seven, had said, we don't want you and we're not going to support you. But Abraham Lincoln said, uh, the job of the chief magistrate is to accept the government as it is tended to his hand and to transmit it unimpaired to his successor. And in his, uh, I didn't give you the names of the states that seceded. Not that you don't know them already. First state that seceded after Lincoln was elected, South Carolina, December 20th, 1860. The next state, Mississippi, no surprise there, January 9th, 1861. Next date, Florida, coming on right down the line, January 10th, 1861. Alabama, January 11th, 1861. Georgia, January 19th, 1861. Louisiana, January 20th, 1861. Texas, February 1st, 1861. Count them. Seven states had dropped out of the union and said, we're going out. We don't want you. Why, if you were uh, overtaking an organization or a church or a company or a business and those powerful type of entities had uh, decided that they were going to walk out on you before you even get in the seat. Now I'll talk about leadership in a time of trouble. Now, Abraham Lincoln exercised great leadership because most of the country uh, was divided, were trembling, they were anxious, they were double-minded. Uh, the so-called northern states were not ready for war. Abraham Lincoln didn't even believe it was going to be a war. In fact, he didn't believe that those seven states were, were going to secede. He figured they were going to come back. He knew uh, South Carolina was a hot-headed state. Uh, but he had expected that South Carolina would return. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, after his uh, inauguration and uh, his uh, call for 75,000 uh, troops to come and support the Union, uh, Virginia uh, seceded. And who lived in Virginia was the greatest general that the U.S. military had produced at that time. His name was Robert E. Lee. As a matter of fact, uh, 
uh, Lincoln at first, not Lincoln, but in the person of uh, uh, General Gil Scott, uh, had first offered the command of the entire United States military to General, excuse me, to uh, Robert E. Lee. He was the general at that time. And it was a position that he had always coveted. But yet, Lee went with his state of Virginia against the United States of uh, America. I don't want to bore you too much with history, but I'm trying to show you how leadership steps in uh, and, and, and takes the hand that is dealt and moves on with it. Uh, where would the country have been if, if uh, Lincoln had acquiesced uh, at that time or thrown in the towel or give up? Or giving up. Seven states walking out on you. Seven states. Hmm? Uh, all of those, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, senators and representatives giving their good vibes in the Congress and giving some of them giving the, the country the finger uh, because they have been working in the background for months and if not years to undermine the uh, government of the United States, there were the Southern sympathizers. Uh, the Southern sympathizers were really in charge of uh, the government for the most part. Most of the uh, West Point graduates, Southerners. Uh, uh, Lincoln's Secretary of War, I think of his name right this second, Southern sympathizer. And that means he had been working for months to send. Military supplies, a detour of military supplies from their 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 their, their proper uh, point where they were supposed to have been going. He had been what detouring those supplies and weapons and monies and all of that to what the southern states. He'd been working on that behind the scenes uh, for a long time. The uh, uh, administration of uh, uh, Buchanan, who was the immediately successor to Lincoln, was riddled with Southern uh, sympathizers. They had gone so far that a commission had come uh, from uh, the Southern states to to meet with uh, Buchanan to begin dividing up. <laughs> you believe that? Believe that? Tell me. Began dividing up the resources of the United States government between North and South. How in the world could the South claim resources that they had not bought? But they were claiming armories. Uh, they tried to claim uh, the, uh, not the Mint, but the next thing to the Mint, because the Mint was in Fort Knox. But they uh, attempted to, to, to arrogate, appropriate, or misappropriate, just take by force of arms. Uh, many of the... Uh, Properties that belong to uh, the United States proper as a as a government, which is why uh, Lincoln said in his uh, first inaugural address, "said Now look, I'm going to preserve, protect, and defend," which is what they talk about now when they take the oath of office uh, in the Congress. We, we take an oath to to preserve, to protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Well, Lincoln said that way back then. He said, "Look, I got to, I got to occupy." I've got to protect, and I, I've got to preserve the, uh, the 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 property of this country. Now, that's leadership, and uh, we should take a big page out of of of, uh, of uh, notice and instruction and uh, training, and learn as much as we can. Glean as much as we can in the leadership category. Those of you that study leadership and want to be so-called leaders, uh, God help you. Uh, but if you had been Abe Lincoln confronted with the loss of seven states before you ever got in the seat, you might not have got in there. You might would have quit. Lincoln didn't quit. Didn't give up. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Let's see, Virginia, Arkansas, and North Carolina. I didn't mention Texas, did I? Texas was one of the seven states that seceded originally. And then comes Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina. 
And uh, I didn't put Tennessee down there because Tennessee was a question mark. Uh, later history says that uh, that was, that was those the, at, at the Tennessee administration did not want to succeed secede from the Union, but neither did they want the uh, Union troops on their soil. And uh, Tennessee had to be put in the category with uh, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, which became border state, uh, because uh, Maryland sent uh, troops to the south and to the north. Missouri sent troops to the south and to the north. Uh, Kentucky definitely sent troops to the south and uh, and to the north, but they did not secede. And uh, Lincoln had said, uh, I hope God is with me, but I must have Kentucky. Because <laughs> if I don't have Kentucky, then the game would really be over because the, 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 those that are fighting against us would be more than those that are on our side. Going back to the leadership issue, talk, listen talk to Abraham Lincoln talking to his uh, secretary. He says, uh, this is in 1861, it says, For my part, I consider that the central idea pervading this struggle is the necessity. Notice he said necessity. That is upon us of proving uh, whether a popular government is not an absurdity. We must settle this question now, whether in a free government, the minority have the right to break up the government whenever they choose. If we fail in this, it will go far to prove the incapability of the people to govern themselves. That's Abraham Lincoln, honest Abe, tender Abe, the one that the Southerners called the buffoon or the gorilla. Seems like he had a pretty good grasp of leadership. He went on to say, uh, not in that speech, but in the speech to the Congress of the United States at some uh uh, later date in that same year, he addressed this issue. He says, now the issue be, that is a, to be addressed uh, by the whole family of man uh, is the question whether a constitutional republic or a democratic government of the people by the same people can or cannot maintain its integrity against its domestic foes. And it presents the question whether this contented individual who did not win at the ballot box can break up their government and thus practically put an end to free government upon the earth. It forces us to ask, in all republics, this where am I? inherent, do all, excuse me, do all Republics have this inherent and fatal weakness. Is there in all republics this inherent and fatal weakness? Must a government of necessity be too strong for the liberties of its people or too weak to maintain its own existence? This is Abe Lincoln, and he answers the question by saying, this is essentially a people's contest on the side of the Union. It is a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and substance of government whose leading objective is to elevate the condition of men, to lift artificial waste from all shoulders, to clear the path of laudable pursuit for all, to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life. Now, that's leadership. That is leadership, clear-eyed, clear-thinking, well-articulated uh, statements of fact, of truth, of policy, of principle. And upon those principles and those policies, the United States was prepared uh, to act, even at a time when it looked like the United States was going to what? Lose. It looked as though when those seven states uh, pulled out and then uh, South Carolina fired on Fort Sumter and then took Fort Sumter. 
it didn't look like they were going to do. The United States had much of a, a a good outlook on winning the war, but Lincoln never quit. He never gave up. He never capitulated. Uh, while uh, Jefferson Davis was talking about our two countries, Lincoln continued to talk about our one common country. And uh, he plays quite a uh, uh, quite a view, uh, brutal uh, beating upon the South. You know, I'm trying not to start cussing. <laughs> he plays quite a, view, a brutal beating upon uh, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee and all of those fellas there for their brashness, for their rashness, and 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 in trying to destroy uh, the Union. Uh, remember, uh, Lincoln said that the union is perpetual and that all of these resolves and ordinances y'all passing, uh-uh, ain't about nothing. That's leadership. That's leadership. And so as we start off the new year, we are, we are looking uh, for leadership. And remember, we are still talking about reparation. I was talking about it today with a friend of mine. He said that uh, the uh, people from China don't want to pay reparation. We don't give... Uh, uh, <clears throat> The people from China uh, own so much of this government and so much government bonds, so much uh, government debt. But the people in China were not under slavery. We were. And uh, more likely, the people from China benefited as a direct or indirect result of the enslavement of our people, which I had a witness. And so, uh, regardless of how rough the road, we must persevere in our quest for our legitimate right and our God-given right to receive uh, reparations from our own nation. Uh, As uh, Dr. Claude Addison said, the people who are U.S. blacks, not any other... uh, nationality, whether you're from the Caribbean or Jamaica or Barbados or anywhere like those people did not suffer the Holocaust that we suffered here in the United States. And they still have a homeland to return to where this is our home. And so we must insist that we receive reparations and that they do not receive any part of our reparations. Fair enough? Because why? Their wealth is far surpassing ours because they have what? Benefited from the fact that they have accents and doors have been opened to them that were closed to the U.S. born uh, blacks in America. And remember, if you are from from the other countries, you have uh, minority status. And according to Jesse Helms and Strom Thurmond, in order to pass the affirmative action thing, they had to give it to every minority. So that meant the midget and the humpback and the one eye and everybody else got in on our uh, affirmative action. Remember, you're in a new year, but the principles of capitalism still remain. The CEOs are making bank, making $29 million a year, and they don't want to pay you nothing but kibbles and bits. They want to cut your hours. They want you to work on the holidays and take comp time and replay. I'm telling you again, as I've always told you, start you a business, start you an enterprise, start you something that you can make money for yourself, because if they don't want to pay you on these jobs in 2020, have 2020 vision and don't work for them. God bless you. Thank you, Doc. No, I won't. No, I won't. I won't complain.